recorded because we have uh, some people online. Uh, we have a Manville crew. Uh, I think we have uh, who is it? Lynn uh, from Beaver, and we have one from St. Paul that is going to be clicking in as well. And we've got John and Matt from uh, Wainwright and Edgerton. So we'll just try and keep our noise down in here because the microphone picks it up uh, with the chairs, them. So, the chairs, yeah, the chairs, they can hear everything. So uh, if anybody here has to take a call, just put your phones on silent. Just uh, go out the door and take a call. We'll probably go for about 45 minutes or so, take a five, 10 minute stretch break. I'm not one for teaching more than an hour at a time. Uh, okay, so this course uh, syllabus, the outline that you have, the ones that uh, online, okay, this course syllabus or course overview. So today we're gonna be going through chapters one to four. Uh, so that's introduction to vehicle X. Uh, extra, extrication incident management, vehicle anatomy and science, extrication uh, equipment. Uh, Thursday, we're going to go from 7 to 10 on Thursday, okay, instead of 6, so it gives everybody time to have a bite to eat. We're going to go through chapters 5 to 8, so that's extrication techniques, passenger vehicle ex extrication, bus extrication, medium and heavy truck extrication. Please have these chapters read, browse through before we come here, okay? Uh, so on Saturday from 9 a.m. To, to, we're gonna go nine to four here, but uh, put it nine to six just to be on the safe side, all right? We're gonna do practical stations in the morning. So outside, we're gonna just do a bunch of uh, different stations, uh, cribbing, uh, scene safety, strut use, power tool operation, hand tools, which airbags, air chisel, and patient care handling. In the afternoon, we'll start doing scenarios. For, and Sunday will be all, uh, all scenarios again. Okay. Uh, next Tuesday, October 3rd, again, 7 to 10, pre-read chapters 9 to 11. We're going to be doing rail car extrication, uh, industrial agricultural vehicle and machinery extrication, and special extrication situations. Thursday, October 5th, uh, we're going to do Chapter 12, EMS Rescue Considerations. Okay, this will be a pretty lengthy, uh, that'll be a couple of hours just for that. Uh, not everybody uh, has an EMS background. We've got quite a few that do, but uh, this will be a, a thick chapter. And we have a local paramedic that's going to be uh, teaching that. And what we'll do after that is we're going to do a review of all the chapters, just kind of scan through everything. If anybody has any questions, concerns, <clears throat> issues, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll deal with it that night. Thursday, October 12th, uh, from 7 to 9, I'm going to have an optional night here. So uh, basically it's going to be q and I'm going to have, I'll have practice tests. Uh, I'll have it online as well. So if you want to just take it and print it off online. Uh, but what we'll do and what I've done in the past is We'll uh, go through some questions and just have people answer them. And I think it's a good learning tool. It kind of preps you for some of the questions that you're going to be facing with the exam. So these are just questions that are from the IFSTA, from the instructor's package. Okay, they're not the government uh, questions you're going to write. I wish I could have them for you, but we don't. So that'll be that whole night. It's just going to be some review questions. Uh, Saturday, October 14th, 8 p.m. sharp. The uh, proctor will be here and we'll write the exam that morning. Okay? Uh, what it does, we're going to have it on Sunday. We're going to write it Saturday now. That way it gives us all day Sunday to just bang off all the scenarios. And depending on how many uh, scenarios the uh, evaluator wants, uh, say we might be, we probably won't be here till 4. But what we'll do is we'll get the people, because we have people traveling for the practical of the evaluations, we'll get them on their way first, and then we'll finish with the vulnerable guys if, if need be. So we'll see how that goes. Any questions on this timeline? Okay. It is up to you to read the chapters. We're going to be going through, there's a lot of information in this book, as I'm sure you've uh, perused through it. Okay. We 
cannot do through every slide. We cannot go through every paragraph in the book. So we're going to be flying through stuff. Okay, it's up to you guys to. I'm just going to hit some key key points. Okay, uh, I've got some uh, notes made where I think this is something you definitely want to know for an exam. Okay, this is a relatively 1006 has been around for quite a while. This is just a new standard that uh, what I've been told in the province just came uh, was released in 2014. So uh, basically, vehicle rescue one, which is level one, which is what we're taking, is a fairly new standard. So this is all brand new questions, okay? brand new skills um, uh, as part of the whole uh, NFPA 1006. Uh, six standard. We're working on chapters five and six out of the uh, 1006 standard. So there's confined space to sort of technical uh, awareness that every that everybody in this room took. Uh, technical rescue one and two, confined space, trench rescue. They're all chapters in 1006. Okay. Any questions on this? No. Nope. Uh, everybody got handed uh, a skill sheet. Okay, read through these, okay, this is what you're going to have to do for the evaluator. You're going to have to know this knowledge for your exam, all right, uh, it's 50 questions, so 50 questions out of this book, it's a, it's a lot of reading material, it's up to you guys to read through the skills, and okay? we're going to make sure that you guys know the skills, all right, we're going to go through them, but read through them so you get an idea of what we're looking for uh, who here has the S uh, S eleven hundred course? So one, two. Yeah, you would be taking Winnipeg. Yeah. Okay. So three people. What the S eleven hundred course? Uh, it was talking about extrication and disentanglement. That's pretty much what that course was about. This one now is everything from scene safety, fire management, incident command. It's the whole nine yards about vehicle rescue from the moment you get dispatched to the moment we terminate an incident and we do a review of what transpired on our seats. Okay? S1100 basically talks just about the tools, how to extricate somebody and how to dis uh, disentangle someone from, from a wreck. It doesn't go into all the heavy machinery that we're going to be going into. Okay, So it's quite detailed. You will be tasked, every one of you, okay? you may be seen command, you may be given something as easy as holding a fire extinguisher for fire control. Okay? Uh, it'll be up to the evaluator how he wants to team everybody up. Okay? Uh, and again, he, uh, he understands our volunteer world, so uh, he, and he comes from that as well. So uh, when I talk with him, he you know, will try to put people in positions that they're so if someone brand new is not going to get, you know, is not going to get put into incident command for the evaluation, but you have to know it through the skills. If you have any questions through the skills, please ask when you're doing scenarios. Take a chance. Chris knows how to do incident command. Okay, so you know, I won't put him as incident command in scenarios. I want people to get outside their comfort zone uh, and get into those roles. Okay, so know your skills. Hang on here, I've got another AVG message. Hopefully that stays away now. Okay, extrication, disentanglement, and rescue. What is extrication? By definition, anybody know? Removal of person from a vehicle. Removing, removal and treatment of patients who are trapped in by some sort of a manly uh, machinery or equipment. Disentanglement is removing, uh, removing the vehicle, the object, away from the patient. Okay, so you're manipulating the vehicle so that we can extricate that person out. Okay. And rescue is removing the patient from an intendable scene. All right. So, sorry, guys. I'm keep getting this ABG message up here that won't we'll leave.
What's that? It's saying that I've got a threat and it's blocking. Oh my lord, this is you can't advance or anything that no, I can't, it just keeps popping up on the screen, so Sorry guys, it just keeps popping up on my screen here. I can't see what's Yeah, John, you can advance them, but I can't see what's on the screen here. But I guess you know, what, you know if you do it, I can see what's on. Can you hear me? If I say advance the screen, good man. All right. So some of the organizations organizations that we are responsible to. Uh, next screen, to John. Okay. So organizations that. Uh, Perform roles in our extrication. So, US DOT, that doesn't pertain to us, that's the Department of Transportation in the US. Okay. Uh, next screen, because those ones are all United States. ANSI, where do we where do we find ANSI in our line of work? What do we what is mandatory to wear as a traffic incident? A vest. Vests are all need a certain ANSI coat. All right, so that's uh, our coveralls, bunker gear. They uh, they should meet a certain level of ANSI, which means that on traffic, uh, technically, what you have for gear should work for traffic. We use the traffic vest just as extra, okay, for high vis. Uh, NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, that runs. The, those are the ones that they uh, develop the technical uh, guidelines that we follow. So this course is NFPA. 1006, all right? We fall under NFPA 1670, which is uh, its technical rescue. Transport Canada, Transport Canada is the organization that looks after the highway systems, all right? That's who the big rigs, the buses, they all uh, conform to Transport Canada. Uh, next one. <clears throat> Turk. So, uh, this is an organization that basically uh, identifies the, the rescue uh, components, uh, emergency rescue components in transportation. They, uh, they look after uh, making sure that everybody's sort of on the same page when it comes to uh, vehicle rescue, okay? And that's with National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, investigate uh, transportation incidents, right? It's got to be pretty serious. It's not a normal vehicle, okay? Um, dangerous goods they would, anything with airplanes, uh, anything with boats, any accidents like that, uh, the Transportation Safety Board will uh, will definitely be a part of investigation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was that, sorry? Not, you know, is, it, is that American or is that? That's Canadian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, have a, we, have a, we have a board too. Yeah. Right, next slide. Next one. And next one. Okay. Uh, rescue organizations need to meet certain responsibilities, so we comply with laws regulations ensure member training is appropriate and we conform to national standards so part of the uh, what we want to look at is uh, hazard risk assessments written response plans and this is on page 15 in your in your book so i've kind of marked down so you guys want to follow along there so written response plans uh detailed operational procedures sops that's all a part of 
Looks like John R. Street here has an Apple thing now. Never seen so many things come up on my screen. Uh, so, written response plans. Does your department have a written response plan as to how you'll address uh, all situations, whether it's a structure fire, whether it's a vehicle rescue, uh, whether it is uh, a grass fire? What are your procedures? So, we have to have something in place. The standard, the standard operating procedures, uh, the written guidelines, okay? Do we do hazard and risk assessments, okay? uh, Do we do risk, so what is the difference between a hazard and a risk assessment? Anybody know? What would the risk be to us? <coughs> What's that? That's a hazard. That's a hazard. No, uh, so a risk here, do we have a risk of dangerous goods incidents? Yes, we have rail, we have trucks, we're a main corridor. That's a risk. So we have we do risk assessments. What's the potential of that happening? The hazard is a dangerous good, right? Uh, I, I see where you're going with that shared you know, kind of a, if you looked at it that way, yes. But for hazard and risk assessments, okay, hazards are something that we, we face uh, at every situation. The risk is what is the likelihood of it happening. Do we have a risk of having wildland or agricultural fires here? Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Does the city of Calgary have the higher, uh, have the same height, uh, same risk of fires as we do for agriculture? Maybe some stations that are along, you know, uh, in a river corridor. But uh, if you're in the downtown Edmonton, do they have a risk of grass fires or no? Okay. If they're in an industrial section of a city, they have a higher risk of industrial incidents than a department that's in uh, a small residential area, right? So that's the risk. Is what what do we face most? Of? Okay. Uh, authority having jurisdiction and standard operating procedures. Next slide. You can go to the next one too, John. Okay, so the authority having jurisdiction, okay, is uh, someone in the community with the power, okay, to uh, make standards, make policies, make procedures uh, in Beggarville, okay. I am not just the authority having jurisdiction. It is my name that is listed, but I can also pass down AHJ to whoever I, I want. Okay, so uh, if I want to pass uh, authority down to a safety codes officer that's doing uh, general business license inspections, I can. Uh, if I'm not on scene, authority falls to uh, a deputy chief or a captain or a lieutenant. Whoever happens to be at that situation, okay. Uh, and the SOPs again. Do we have written ones? Yes. Have they been reviewed for a while? No. Okay. But is everybody in my department? Are you guys pretty familiar with how things run on uh, a vehicle incident, or how things run on a grass fire, or how things run on a, a structure fire? How about you one there? Do you guys have a pretty good consensus as to how you're going to run things? You know who's in charge and how the process works. Okay, so those are your procedures. They should be reviewed uh, uh, more often than than they are, but it is time consuming to review SOPs, and unless it's re reviewed by the entire organization, it becomes very limited because one person. Seems to, if I review it all the time, it always just seems to make sense. When the, when changes need to be made, it's going to be people who are new to the system. They're the ones that are going to generate questions. To me, it's always going to seem like it's normal. Okay. 
You can advance a couple of slides, Joan, to the hazard and risk assessment. All right, risk surveys. Uh, so risk survey is what uh, a department or a municipality, so if we're speaking of a, a fire department uh, or even an EMS department, okay, a risk survey, what risks are out there to us? Uh, if you have a high population of drug addicts in your community, okay, does EMS have a higher uh, risk potential of being uh, hurt, attacked, okay, coming up with a lot of different, you'll, you'll see the risks, right? Uh, if you have uh, a very high population of low income housing, there's a risk for uh, House uh, structure fires. Okay, that's just determined by the surveys and all the data we get. If you get an area that has low low income housing, then you you will get more house fires. We have a risk survey where we have agricultural fires. Okay, how do we how do we overcome those risks? All right. So we put well, we put things in place. The county has, uh, I mean, and Chris can testify to this. You know, five years ago we had way more county grass fires than we do now, and that was simply because the county was just getting filled. They saw an enormous risk that this is the money they were spending by paying for firefighting costs, and it was needless. And I'm sure you guys got the same thing: controlled burns. All of those things, right? In, uh, farmers without uh, having the proper extinguisher on their combine, you know, all of a sudden, nope, I, you know, I forgot that I you know, my extinguisher's in the barn, and all of a sudden now we have a, you know, half a million dollar combine fire. Plus we have a field fire. So what the county started doing is that they started making the home, the landowner, or the whoever can started the fire, making them financially responsible. So all of a sudden, all these controlled burns that we're doing in the winter now come to springtime. We're not seeing as many anymore because the farmers are being held accountable, or the landowners are being held accountable financially. So they're putting the fire out now. It wasn't like, oh, well, you know what, we'll let the fire department worry about it. That's not happening anymore. So the county did a risk, risk survey. And they're saying, you know what, too many controlled burns are getting out of control in the spring. With the dry weather and winds, so they combated it by putting procedures in place that said uh, if it's or policy, you know, they have a permitting system, but they also have a thing now is that when the county says there's a fire ban, that means all previously controlled burns. Doesn't mean that you just can't go out and start a burn now. They, if you had a fire, it's up to you to check, and if it, it does get away, you will be held responsible. Okay, so that's. So for us, risks, uh, so for instance, uh, a little tiny department between two major metropolises, okay? They do a lot of assisting, and you might find this a lot, you know, you'll see this in Beaver uh, with all the municipalities. Um, is it feasible for every community to go and buy a $600,000 rescue truck with all, the, with all the tools and all the bells and whistles, okay? No. Okay. If you don't have a lot of big truck traffic coming through your community, do you go and spend twenty thousand dollars on an airbag kit and another twenty you know, fifteen thousand on big heavy struts? You know, uh, agricultural. Uh, when we talk about this, agricultural equipment. If a, how many people here have seen a combine tip over in their life on calls? I've seen one in a ditch. And you know, wasn't going very fast. Basically, rolled over. But it was there was nothing we were going to do. We got out there. The, the operator was safe. Uh, basically, it was to bring in a four-wheel drive tractor and basically let him maneuver it, get him to maneuver the combine out of the out of the ditch. Okay, does that warrant going and buying massive uh, agricultural struts? That no. So again, that's a risk assessment. If that was happening once a month, that's probably something that the department could sell to a council and say, 
yeah, we need this, okay? Same as a re rescue, okay? Any questions on that? So basically the risk assessment, we're identifying potential hazards, assess the level of risk, and determine possible rescue situations. Uh, rope rescue, okay? Uh, if you're in a completely flat area, is rope rescue going to be a high priority for you if you had no caverns, okay? Uh, gray bin rescues, okay? We're all suited up in this department for being able to do those kinds of rescues, but yet we've never, we've never responded to a grain bin rescue, okay? Will it happen? Maybe one day, hopefully not, okay? But again, we're prepared for that, but that was an assessment that was done years ago uh, that we decided to get this equipment. Is it feasible for every community around us to spend upwards of 20, 30 grand getting rescue equipment that we probably, like say if we don't use it, what's the chances Mundare is using it or Two Hills or you know, Manville, okay? And it's here, you know, that's what we want to talk about is uh, a, a team effort and knowing what's in your area. Maybe one department gets a heavy, heavy struts and if we know, then you call them, right? Because maybe they do a lot. Maybe Manville needs a set of heavy struts because they deal with that a lot. If they do, great, when we need it, then we page them out as a resource. And we're gonna talk about resources, I think, in, in uh, chapter two, so. Uh, written response plans, next slide. Written response plans provide written details of SOPs, okay? Again, I don't wanna to go too much into detail. This, this is how we do things, right? When uh, we get a vehicle incident, okay? Does command always roll? Doesn't have to, okay? What always needs to roll at a vehicle incident? Rescue. Rescue, okay? Can we get away without having an engine or a tanker on a vehicle rescue? Yes. Sure, because we've got all everything we need on the rescue unit. We've got extinguishers, okay? But uh, if tanker two goes to a vehicle incident, we've got water, we've got extinguishers, but if we can't get people out, so we need rescue. Could, uh, so could an officer take the seat in rescue and function as a complete unit? Yeah, absolutely, okay? It's good to have an extra unit, okay? And we'll talk about that in a later chapter about positioning and uh, basically doing your initial scene size up. So, um, the response organizations, what does everybody, uh, RCMP, they have they have uh, SOPs, they have uh, standards in place that they need to do. EMS has standards in place. You've got Carillion, okay? They have standards in place, okay? What happens if there's a spill cleanup? Who's, whose responsibility is, is, a, is a spill cleanup? Is it the fire departments? Okay. Who's in charge of a, who's in charge of a vehicle incident on a primary and a secondary highway in Alberta? Hmm? RCMP. They're ultimately in charge. So if an RCMP officer comes and says, "I'm in charge," they're absolutely correct, because they are the governing body on a highway in town. It does. Okay. Does that ever happen? I've seen it once in 26 years, and it was a, a simple misunderstanding, okay? And we're talking about it was a major, this is a 26 vehicle pileup. And there was a little jurisdiction war about who was actually in charge of it, okay? But it got fixed, all right? But everybody has a job to do. The RCMP's job is they need to investigate a traffic incident to find out who's at fault. We don't do that. We don't go there and say, oh, okay, it was, that was Durston's fault. Yeah, he must have. He was. He must have been texting, right? Somebody has to be held accountable for damage, right? That's the way our world works. Our RCMP investigate that. EMS have certain uh, set of standards. Okay, this is how. So they don't get. Uh, they don't pull someone out of a car that's got you know a twisted ankle when there's somebody with uh, you know a chest injury, right? So we're going to triage. They have specific standards of how they how they respond and how they do their work. 
same with fire. We have set a set, set of guidelines that we follow. Uh, next slide. All personnel should be familiar with the contents of SOPs. So uh, age requirements, right? Do we let, uh, we have a junior program here, okay? Uh, when we get our pre-information, guys, the officers are already starting to think. It's kind of, this is in chapter two, but we're kind of just bouncing back, okay? But having the right personnel on a call. Uh, in our department, we do uh, air consumption tests. So every firefighter should know what their air consumption is when under heavy, uh, under heavy workload in their full BA and SCBA, or full gear and SCBA. They should know how much air they use per minute. Okay, does anybody, any of you guys remember your numbers? 47? <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> Okay. But then for from a, an officer perspective, you want to have people fitness. Right? This is where I'm kind of going with this is the fitness, uh, expertise, knowledge. Okay. You don't want to put two brand new rookies just because you took 10 to 1, okay, and you got a blazing and you got a house fire, okay? Just because you, you passed 10 to 1 doesn't mean that you're totally competent. So as an officer, that you're in charge of that crew. The deputy chief could be the uh, an ops chief, and then you got a fire chief that could be the incident commander. All that responsibility goes down through down through the pyramid. So a lieutenant or a captain of a truck, you want to make sure that you've got the right people on the on your unit that can do the job. Do we always know exactly what we're faced with? No, but we get some information from. Uh, as much information from dispatch as possible. Uh, EMS training. It's always good to know that you have a couple of people on your rescue truck that have EMS training. Is it a rule, a standard? No. But it's always good to have someone with EMS training because uh, maybe not, because when the alarm comes in, we have no idea if every EMS unit is sitting here waiting to take this uh, Vehicle call. They could be out on transfers. Do you guys do transfers here? <laughs> Just that. <laughs> okay, so they might be gone, right? Uh, and we, we just had an incident on the weekend where Vermilion responded here uh, to a call because our units were were out and about on, on other calls. And you know, did they need to be called? No, there's a miscommunication between myself and the RCMP. I'm in the front of the house. RCMP are in the back. And they're the ones that dispatched ambulance when there was no need to it because they were all fine. They could have been driven by the supervisor to the hospital. But again, miscommunication that happens. All right. We have dedicated EMS, and most of the munis municipalities in Alberta have a dedicated EMS system. Okay. In the United States, this is not, and this is the way these books are written, is from the US. Okay. The U.S. does not always have a dedicated EMS system, all right? A lot of private, a uh, lot of private EMS firms. So the first responders are, and the treatment is made by fire rescue until an ambulance comes, package and go. Okay, so do you find a lot of that? That's why, to, in order to pass, in order to get certification for this course, you have to have the technical rescue awareness which is all the ropes, the knots, and all that stuff. And when you think about it, it's like, well, what does all that have to do with vehicle, rec with vehicle rescue? Well, if a vehicle goes down into a canyon, you have to get all your people, personnel, and equipment down the canyon by a rope in order to get them rescued. And then you got to rope them up and get them hauled to the top so that they can be transported by an ambulance. How often is that going to happen in one day in your vehicle? Canyons, you know, it's not gonna, is it going to happen around Veg? No. You know, the Vermilion Rivers are deep as crevice, right? So, so that, that's how this kind of came about, right? This whole structure. So, uh, safety officer, uh, having a safety officer on scene, okay, it should be mandated in every scene in your policies. It should be mandated that you have a safety officer. Do we always have a safety officer? 
an actual officer or an assigned one. Do we have a safety officer in every scene? Yes. Who? Sure. No. It's always the incident commander. Okay, so there's always a safety officer, but it all it always falls on IC. If he has enough staff, then you assign a specific safety officer. Okay, but it should be mandated in your policies and procedures that there's a safety officer, which incident command can say stop you know, for safety. A safety officer. We're going back to ICS 100 now. A safety officer that's designated. He's the only one that can overrule the incident command by saying an all stop. Okay? The incident commander may not be there. He can be giving instructions. If the safety officer says that's it because of this, he has that power and right. No one else does except the safety officer. Okay? A uh, couple more slides. Objective seven. Okay, this is around page 19 in your textbooks. Next slide, John. Again, operational capability is established by on three criteria. Hazard risk assessment, personnel training, and internal and external resources. Okay? Let's So hazard risk assessment, what are we dealing with? Okay. Do, we, do we have the capability, first of all, to take care of this? If there's a major dangerous goods incident in our community on Highway 16, do we have the capability to take care of that with our department? <coughs> a major dangerous goods incident? No. Do we have training? Yes. Yes, because you all just took it, right? But we don't have, we have, do we have all the equipment in our, yeah, we got all the equipment yeah, no, it says the training goes. It's expired, maybe. It's expired. So, yes, we have equipment, but it's not, it's not current. So, we don't have the re proper resources, okay? Do you guys have heavy rescue system in Monday? I don't think you have any you guys do, do you? But you guys can do standard extrications, right? So, uh, so the big trucks, a big, uh, a big uh, semi truck rolls over. Okay, our trucks that we have touch and go whether or not we could use it for a heavy rescue. Okay, but again, we've we've had trucks roll over quite often, but never where we've had to support them. Okay, and if there ever was a need for that, generally it was, it was becoming a recovery, not a rescue anymore. Okay, so again, you, you balance out, you have to weigh out your needs. Do we spend $20,000 on a set of heavy struts for something that we may have used once, you know, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years? If you save one person, you could justify that it was worth the, the purchase, okay? But when it sits there and it gets outdated because it's equipment, uh, it's just like the airbags. You know, you can buy an air, an air safety equipment is a lot like Apple phones, you know, your technology, okay, it doesn't take too long before it's outdated okay, and they're coming up with something more effective. Uh, we have three levels uh, of capabilities. We have awareness, operations, and technician. Everybody remembers kind of from, from Hazmat, right? Awareness, you know what's going on. Okay, you can identify this, you can secure a scene, you can protect people. And so that nobody else gets hurt. Operations, you're taking it a step farther, and you're going to start to minimize the damage and uh, beyond protecting, okay? Uh, mitigating fuel releases, things like that. And technician level, you're going uh, even farther than farther than that. So, in the 1006 world, the so sorry, NFPA 1670, it pretty much follows. The same as uh, the has the hazmat. Uh, a couple more slides there, John. Okay, so uh, extrication, PPE, and, and equipment. 
and we are on page 20 now, okay? Do you have to wear bunker gear? Hmm? You should, okay? Unless you have to replace So we're thinking about, you know, this whole, uh, again, we're looking at the, the U.S. kind of model. This is the one we kind of have to follow, okay? Rescue crews go, and they're not always the first ones on scene, okay? The nearest rescue truck could be 10 miles down the road. Not every hall in Edmonton has a rescue truck. They've got ladders, they've got engines, but they don't all have rescue trucks. So when they need a rescue, who's the first truck usually on scene? It's usually a... It's usually an engine company, okay? Engine company or ladder company out of, out of a station. Then they call for, you know, dispatch gets more information, they're calling a rescue. They're getting more information, they're gonna call a battalion chief, okay? It, it's like us where rescue, command rolls out, rescue rolls out, tanker two rolls out. How's that now? Jay, you're not doomed. <laughs> okay, so just let me know because my uh, computer, my uh, tablet times out. I can change out the brief. I'll change out the brief. Okay. Uh, so where were we? Yeah, so the PPE. Okay. Yes, bunker gear should be worn for firefighters. Okay. But things that are critical, okay, helmet, gloves, CSA boots, glasses, okay. Could you perform an extrication with coveralls on? Sure, why not? Not to say you couldn't, okay. It's a challenge because, you know, because you were trying to decide, well, I'll wear my bunker gear today. So we just have a standard, we wear bunker gear. But if you're on a specific rescue truck, you know what? Your job might be just to go and be in coveralls with helmet and boots and gloves and be able to extricate. Because maybe the firemen are inside in their bunker gear. I wouldn't put any of my crew in the back seat of a car that's been in a collision, glass everywhere, in coveralls. I'd put you in bunker gear. But if I asked somebody, if, my, if I needed somebody to use a set of jaws to crack open a door, yeah, if they were in coveralls and that was their specific job, yeah, that that could that's very doable. Okay, but those are the key things that we need: okay? helmet, face, eye protection, face protection, gloves, and boots. Right, the coveralls. Yes, that's good. Uh, traffic control. You want a vest, right? Uh, I mean, and that's our policy. Doesn't matter where you are, you'll be in a vest if you're on a traffic incident. Doesn't matter if you're cutting someone out of the vehicle or you're five, you're a mile down the road doing traffic. You're wearing a traffic. Best. That's just, those are our policies, okay? Um, that's it. Next, next slide. Steps that should be taken to keep extrication equipment available. Identify what you need, okay? As people go to training, people go to conferences, people hook up with salesmen, they just Go and stop at another fire station. You may just drive by another MVC and say, oh, look what those guys are using, okay? And bring it back and say, you know what? We identified, you know, this is something we, we could use, all right? Then if budget allows it, we acquire it, okay? I mean, keep a list of it because it's very easy to put something in a cupboard and then it gets forgotten about, especially if you don't use it too often, okay? And then maintain it. All this equipment needs to be maintained. It needs to be used in practice, in training, because that helps build confidence. It you, gets you familiar with the, uh, uh, to be honest with you, like the struts. When we first bought the struts, I was very proficient at it. 
you know what? I haven't taken part in strut training, so I had to do a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, work, you know, prior to this class about even how to set the strut up anymore. Because I don't do that, right? You guys probably have a better idea of how to set the struts up than I do. Okay? Uh, and then train on it. Okay? So that's a constant circle. Identify what you what it is you need, acquire it, keep track of it, maintain it, train on it. Okay? Big circle. Uh, next slide. So we just talked about that. Uh, training, you try and training personnel on uh, what equipment to use in care and maintenance. We take care of our bunker gear, our gloves, our face shields, boots. Uh, nothing's worse than going to uh, an MVC in the middle of a wet ditch and then you find out that you know, you've got a hole in your boot. Okay? Uh, capabilities and limitations. Okay? Uh, would you run into a burning building with the bunker gear that you have? Everybody pretty comfortable? You don't want to fire. <laughs> Would you We're going to get rid of one of our students. <laughs> okay. But that's, that's your guys' equipment. It's, you know, we, we will help you maintain it, give you the resources. But at the end of the day, it's your guys' equipment. And I don't know how many times we've gone to calls and guys have said, oh, I don't have a balaclava or I don't have gloves. Okay. That's up to you before you leave the station. When you go on a call, you have all the equipment you need. Okay? And because that you're the one that's going into the into a burning building, you're going to be doing uh, that task that you've been given. So you have to make sure that your equipment, your PPE is, is all ready for that. Next slide. After action reviews, okay, used in conjunction with a debrief, right? What's the purpose of an after action review? To learn what you could have done better. What, 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 what worked? Okay? Always start by saying what worked. Okay? What did we do good at? Okay? It's never good to start a debrief by saying, hey, Jordan, you didn't do that right. And Colin, you didn't do that right. Emmanuel, you could have done this better. John, yeah, you didn't do that right either. Okay, what were the positives? If you have that many negatives, I'd say the whole scene is bad. The whole bad. The lights work. Yeah. Okay. What what worked? What did we do well on that scene? Okay, and then we get the people talking. After action reviews are very good to do right on scene when they're done. Okay, very quick. Give a quick explanation. Uh, what what worked? You know, here's what the We'll go back now. Sorry, Joe, this is all the way that you're trying to use picking on me. <laughs> Who is John? I'm not picking on John. I didn't think so. Uh, thanks, John. Turn me off. Okay, debrief. It's good to do it right on the scene, a quick one, okay, and then go back. When you get to the station and things are cleaned up, okay, everybody's back in service, and then do a, a bigger debrief. Okay, that's where you would want to highlight uh, any any errors, okay, or you know, things that we can do better. It's not something you want to do on public. Okay, you, you don't want a twenty mile ride back uh, in a rescue unit and then have somebody, the chief officer. You know, identify what Colin, you know, you did this wrong on that scene, and then the other five people in the rescue truck. Hopefully, that doesn't happen. Okay, but yeah, you know, you did that wrong, and I told you so. It's good to do that stuff back at the station, and then it's good to incorporate that with a debrief. How is everybody doing with the scene? Was it traumatic? And then we start we start building on our uh, on our debriefs from there. Okay. And decide how much we you know what how further we need to go. Um, couple more slides, page twenty-two in the book. Next one. Okay, so rescue personnel must develop the skills necessary for a safe extrication. 
recognize the dangers. So what are some dangers at an extrication? What? Traffic? No, you just spurred about fire. Huh? Yeah. fire hazard, sure. Fuel? Fuel instability. Fuel instability. What's that? No. Yeah, more, that's sharp objects. Bystanders. What's that? Bystanders. Yeah, bystanders. Okay. okay. What else? Yeah, dangerous goods, yeah. Hey, what about the patients? Okay, that's not really a hazard. Yeah, it's not intoxicating. The public. <laughs> yes, very true. That's only in Edgerton that you have crazies. Okay, write your name on it. Jace, yeah, Jace's explosions. Yeah, explosions. Okay, what about biohazards? Blood. Uh, what's the big thing now that is uh, got all cops uh, panicking out there? Drugs, fentanyl, fentanyl dust. You know, they're, they're stopping vehicles, taking an inhalation of this stuff and passing out where the, the person driving could be high as a kite, but they're used to it. The cop gets one whiff and the next thing you know, they're, they're down and out EMS, same thing. You know, this is becoming prevalent in the fire, uh, fire industry too. I was just at a conference in Vancouver, the city of Vancouver, so just downtown Vancouver, every single day, they have a minimum of 75 fentanyl calls. 75 calls a day minimum. And that's, that's 600,000 people in an area about the size of Sherwood Park. So again, so those, those, those are hazards that we're now doing. We're constantly dealing with new hazards, okay? But recognizing those dangers, resist the urge to rush in, all right? We don't want to rush, we don't want to rush to the scene. That's our mentality, we're driven by that, by saying, you know what, we want to go help people, right? Is there a power line down? Okay, did you, can you see it? Who, you, you know what, unless you do that calm walk around, it's very difficult to say, uh, you know, yeah, I, I've noticed every hazard. And is everybody guilty of it? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and every situation is different. You got screaming people in a car with smoke. Okay. Fire firemen, uh, you know, goggles come on, and you know what? I got to go rescue them from the fire. But yeah, you don't see uh, the uh, an electrical line in the puddle in the water that they knocked down. Okay. You may not see other other potential hazards. Understanding safety, okay, it's the toughest job, especially when you get into incident command, okay, or being an officer of a truck, is holding people back and saying, okay, let's look at the situation, let's assess, come up with a plan, okay, and then go do the plan, all right? A lot of this follows our, our good old ICS, okay, and develop, get, gather your information. Can this be done in seconds? Absolutely. With years and years of experience, can you double hat some of those things and they all very come very quick? Yeah, absolutely. Can you look around and say, I don't see a power pole in sight? Can you assume that there's probably no power line? It could be underground, but that car would have to make a serious you know, dent in, there, in the earth, right? But if you're on a country road and there's not a house in sight and you've got a vehicle in the middle of a field, What's the, what's the potential of having an electrical hazard? Probably very slim, okay? Uh, we've had a, was it Edison had a call where uh, a vehicle went, uh, rolled in a farmer's yard and went through, the, went through some fences in the corrals and yeah, the vehicle sitting there, we have to get to the patient because it had rolled and yet yeah, everybody rushes there and guess what's standing about 75 feet away from the car. Yeah, 2,000 pound piece of angry hamburger and you're in his spot, okay? Is that a hazard? Yeah, if he charges, yeah, it's a hazard, okay? So again, how often does that happen? You know, are you going to, is every fire department going to start carrying one of those frauding things now? Can no, way. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> well, that's, that's, be that's, that's a risk to the community. It would be good for those fire chiefs in Edgerton. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch the comments. You'll watch the comments? Okay. <laughs>
So assess the situation. Okay, yep. here we go. <laughs> Resist the urge to run. <clears throat> Make informed decisions, all right? Uh, try before you pry. That's our golden rule, right? Before you go smashing in people's doors at fires, try and open it, okay? Rather than damaging a $400, $1,000 door, see if it opens first. Nothing's different here, okay? <laughs> This is Edgerton uses one for crowd control. Oh. <laughs> uh, if, 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 that was James, sorry. If a person, if a, if a patient doesn't need, if we're not in a massive rush and we've got time to work with them, do we cut open the roof of their car when the, you know, the car may have been salvage, salvageable? We've seen it, okay? We've seen people go in there and just start tearing apart a car. Uh, we were guilty of it here once, uh, with a hybrid hybrid vehicle that was yeah. just when they were starting to come up and it was a small fender bender what did we always do about it back in the past what was the first thing the officer called for cut the battery, cut the battery. why if you what Air 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 okay do we, do we do that now we don't need to okay we don't need to cut we don't need to cut the lines you looked at me kind of funny we don't cut, but we disconnect. We don't need to actually disconnect it because anything past 2007, and we'll go in that to a, in another chapter. Okay? But yeah, that's what we always did. We cut battery. So we cut the battery on this hybrid car, and we, at uh, the fire department, actually made that car inoperable and, re and unfixable. Insurance ended up replacing the entire car because the amount of damage we did by cutting a cable was far beyond the extent of any of the damage that the two vehicles colliding did. Learned something. We learned something that day. Okay, and when that vehicle owner came here and just he was laying on to the chief, like about we didn't know what we're doing. We're like, we cut the battery cable. And what we also found out a little bit later was that had we cut that cable like two feet down, it could have been an instant death for. The person making that cut. So we learned. Thank God it wasn't a tragedy, but we learned. So then, what what, what happened? We brought in a hybrid vehicle specialist, and we did a presentation. Does does everybody know every hybrid car where to cut? No. Okay. Is it? Do you know? Do we know signs what to look for now? Yeah. Yeah, and we've got enough enough capability in our department now that we know if you go to certain spots that's where the cut point is and it's been identified that was in that vehicle that we cut but we didn't know about it it was relatively new but we so we're, we're constantly learning so making informed decisions we want to we want to make sure we're doing the least amount of damage we're being the most effective that we can when it comes to uh, getting the patient out that's our primary concern it's getting the patient out and making sure we're all safe, but let's do it effectively, right? We don't need to cut every door, every uh, every B post, and okay? we don't have to smash every piece of glass. We we want to get them out as quick as and efficiently as possible. Get your when you make your decisions and then de devise your and implement your plan of action, right? The plan of action. So when we're saying rescue personnel, develop skills necessary for safe extrication. Part of that is also where are we going to park our trucks, okay? How are we going to do traffic control? Does traffic control, is it different at Highway 36 and 16 as opposed to uh, Range Road 152 and Township uh, 520, which is in the middle of the country? Yeah, okay. Yeah, traffic control is a whole different process. Anybody that's had a, I don't know if they have cars that drive by Edgerton, but I know in Manville and Mandare and Vegreville, it's pretty busy. Wow. <laughs> there we go. It's moving. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, anyone that's been lead of running water, too. <laughs> pretty, pretty soon you'll have internet. <laughs> so, yeah, anybody that's done a vehicle extrication on 36 and 16, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, 
Okay, so your plan of action. Okay? <coughs> How are we going to keep everybody safe? How are we going to get the patient extricated, disentangled, and in the safe hands of the BMS on, on route? To medical care and how are we going to get the situation cleaned up? Ultimately, we want to get from something bad's happened, we want to get back to normal. Okay, and we're responsible for that part in between with EMS, with fire, or with RCMP, with uh, all our different resources. Uh, so, next slide. So, available resources. What do we have available to us, okay? Uh, what do you guys do if you have a uh, semi-truck with a bunch of hogs on it that's rolled over in the ditch? What do you guys do? Huh? Okay, so who, who would mutual aid be? Hmm? Yeah, you know what, don't, don't call us because we don't have the capability to handle hogs or chickens or turkeys or cows, okay? We do the, we, we have a, situ, a system in place now that myself, the deputy chiefs, the captains, we know that we can call Peter Cheddar from the Vegable Colony and if he can't help us, he's got a quick dial to one of the other colonies that knows exactly how they're going to rectify our situation. When we have a semi truck roll over that had, I don't know what it have, 140 hogs on it. A yeah. bunch are dead in the truck, a whole bunch are alive in the truck, and there's a whole bunch that are running around Highway 16, and people are driving down the road and they see a pig in the road, they're still going slow. You know what? They're not stopping, they're just trying to maneuver around these things, right? So, Okay, you call in the professionals and they dealt with it very easily, okay? Same as a turkey truck that rolled over, 10,000 turkeys. We don't have the capability to deal with that. You call in professionals, okay, how to raise. Uh, if you're gonna be in a massive incident and uh, traffic is of uh, supreme importance, okay? Who's the best people to call for traffic? Brilliant. Brilliant. They got all the signboard trucks, they got everything they need. It takes them a while to get set up, but once they're set up, guess what? They're free and clear. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? Um, so the local response system. Uh, Johnny, do you know how to how to get a hold of Peter Cheddar? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, do you know how to get a hold of Peter Cheddar? No. I was gonna say he probably comes to call yeah. for gas, but yeah. Okay, but do you know where to get these resources? If you needed a uh, quantum Murray to come clean up a spill, you know where to get a hold of them. <laughs> okay, again, you what? Know, but these are things that, uh, like Chris and I know, because we. It's not smoke. Is that just me? That's you the campfire, Mike? You were the last one in. Yeah. Yeah, I smell smoke too. I can smell it now. Oh, uh, sorry. Dave King just said, burn it over and he's burning probably at Hell's Farm. Just <laughs> sorry, sorry, guys, we smell smoke here. We're just going through our evacuation. <laughs> okay, how to activate your local response? Uh, vehicle construction. Are there different kinds of vehicle constructions? Yes, there's three main ones. Okay, we'll discuss that in chapter three. But what's the vehicle construction? Okay, crash dynamics. Was it head on? Was it side impact? Was it rear end? Was it a rollover? Okay, was it a crush? Was it? Okay. Uh, patient entrapment. So, how was the patient trapped? What's the mechanism of injuries that they have? Did they go slamming into the seatbelt? Was it a side impact and they've got broken legs? Uh, is the vehicle stable? So uh, that's one of our main concerns when we start. We don't want to be working on something that's unstable. 
So stabilizing it at first. If a vehicle is stable, then you know what we don't have to stabilize it. If it's stuck in mud, okay, do you have to stabilize it? No. Again, whose decision is that? I see or whoever he delegates. And scene control and protection. Where are we? Are we down are we at 50th and 50th? Where the entire town is coming to have a look? Okay. The fatal that we had that one morning at what? Five five nineteen in the morning, okay, on a Sunday. I was shocked that within half an hour, that many people in Beggarville were around our scene. But it gets out like that, right? And people know, so then they want to go have a look. And again, that scene safety. That wasn't a high concern because you know, for when I when I got there, you know, okay, it's not really a big deal. It's five o'clock in the morning. It's not on a Sunday. We're not going to have a lot of people. No, wrong. You know what? I could use more people for traffic control, so then we end up making a call for more people because uh, we just can't keep up with everybody trying to sneak by. So, again, these are things that your critical information that we that we need all personnel need to be aware of. Okay, it's not always your responsibility, but if you identify it, you certainly need to let somebody know. And this is as officers. Uh, if you're the lead truck, you should be able to identify these things and get the, the resources that we need. Next slide. Um, so rescue and protection. Again, that's not just gear. Okay? That could be positioning of trucks. We had a motor vehicle, we had a single vehicle rollover, I don't know, maybe five years ago, out by the bridge on Highway 16. And it was a construction zone, bridge repair, at what, two o'clock in the morning or something like that? The guy fell asleep and he went through uh, about eight of those big barrel drums. He went through eight of them that were all nicely placed by Carillion. He went through uh, a three quarter inch gigantic signboard that said, Keep left, construction ahead. Smashed through that with his Pontiac on fire. Then he hit one of those big concrete berms, blocks that was there protecting the Atco trailer that was the construction foreman's trailer. And he split that in half. He was fine and dandy, but he woke up pretty quick when he was hitting those blocks. But at 120, it took about maybe five to 10 seconds for him to fall through all of that. Once he hit that first thing, that first cone, if he has a second to wake up, then you're, you know, he's already hitting some more cones, slams on the brakes, and still had enough velocity that, you know, he, and had he broke, had he uh, applied his brakes a few seconds later, he may have just gone right into that echo trail and been way worse, okay? But just because you have pylons up, what I'm getting at, okay, you're not safe, okay? It still takes some of this, the common sense, all right? That's why in traffic control we talk, never turn your back on the scene, right? Never turn your back on traffic. Never assume that every motoring public is in, is, is in your corner to help you and they're gonna always stay slow. Cody had a classic example on Highway 16 and 36. A truck driver went barreling right through, right past, and I didn't, I, you know, I didn't see the stop, the, the guy with the stop sign. But yet, only a couple hundred feet ahead are five fire trucks and lights everywhere. Tell me you could have seen that. Maybe you didn't see Cody, the, the flag man, but you would have known that up there. So when he passed at 120, guess what? You weren't going to stop in time anyway. So, uh, safe use of, of equipment and tools. Okay. Do you know how to use all that stuff? Can you handle it? Okay. The jaws are not light. Okay. Uh, making sure you don't put your fingers in the wrong place. Okay. Uh, it can be slippery. We, got, we talk about weather. Okay. Uh, being able to hold that properly. If your gloves get slippery and you drop it on your foot, guess what? Now you're a patient. Okay. Uh, being able to assess patients. Okay. Who can properly assess patients? Do you have the medical training to be able to do that? Okay? When you're first on scene, you may not have, you know, you could be a, an MFR, 
you can still assess a patient, okay, do the best you can uh, for when tre treatment, because knowing what the patient's injuries greatly affects how our extrication is, okay? Uh, and again, if you've got somebody who needs rapid intervention, okay, we're maybe going to cut a couple of corners and make sure to, if we have to rapidly extricate someone, okay? And those are those, you know, when you get on scene and you've got a paramedic that says, I need this guy out yesterday, that one in that car can wait. Said, this one needs to be in the hospital within 15 minutes, and your 15 minutes can count, okay? All fine and dandy, but then what else happens with that situation? What's that? Yeah, you're just yeah, rushing. Yeah, you've excited people and rushing, right? So again, it's about staying calm. Okay? <laughs> Jay was saying that other, like other things were pinch points when the tools align or just in general saying getting from the tools in the vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. So good one. Uh, pinch points, right? Anyone that's used those jaws, okay? If you know if you don't go in the right spot, knowing knowing when, when those things break open, where's the door gonna go? Okay? Are you gonna be on this side so that when it pops out the door, the door's coming out to hit you? Or are you on this side so that or, and is it going to come and, is it going to swing by back this way and hit you? It's got to be slow. Again, every car is different, okay? Every situation is different, but that's a part of knowledge, and you gain that through training by constantly trying out the tools and knowing how to operate it. How many people here have tried to operate jaws like this? Sometimes you have to do that, okay? I don't recommend it in the beginning, but you get it in like this, right? Start operating, get tensioned up, then get yourself out of the way. And that's a good point, Jay, with the pinch points. I've seen that too often. You know, people go, you know, will try to do like this, or they go like this, and then all of a sudden it's too late. Okay. Uh, what else was there for? John was just saying, getting the tool in the vehicle, basically. Yeah. Yeah, getting the tool in the vehicle. No, he can tweak the tool and the vehicle. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. So basically. Just basically Okay, uh, body positioning. Body positioning, yeah. So the last thing we want is WCB claims, okay? Just because we're volunteers doesn't mean we can't have WCBs. You know, making sure that you're, you know, you don't, you don't send the shorty to go get your big heavy tools out of the rescue truck so that they pull something, okay? Uh, on scene medical care, okay? What can you do? What did the protocol say? What can the fire department do right now for on scene medical care? What's that? MFR at we're not MFR at this point, are we? No. Well, we are the first aid level. Yeah, we are, but we're just first aid level. First aid level, okay. So even though we've got some EMTs on our department, okay. It's first aid how that EMS with the four number shows up on the back of the white the white van, okay? You're operating at that level, okay? Uh, protecting and pack packaging the patients, okay? What's the easiest way to get them out? I was talking with Kirk that's going to do the the, the medical, the rest EMS medical portion, okay? Uh, we do tons of training on kids. How many people have, how often do you use a kid? Very rarely, right? Okay. But you still got to train on it because you want the time you don't train on it, then you'll need it, right? But uh, transferring patients to EMS again, our EMS are usually on scene. Uh, there's a potential that we could be on scene, and then uh, we could get the patient extricated. We have everything we need to get the patient out, keep them comfortable until EMS arrives. Okay, but again, that. Uh, by extricating them, are we doing more damage? Okay, are we helping them? So it's best. Uh, and, and again, if you've got the knowledge there, so you've got an EMT or a medic that could say, yes, this is what we need to do. Maybe keep them there for now, but let's get everything ready, then extricate them when EMS gets here because they can't be outside for too long. Okay? And he you give me some examples like. Uh, internal bleeding that you know being jammed in there they're probably better off than you know, being out okay. uh, leaving the area in the vehicles in a safe condition right once the patient's out they don't just get in their truck and drive off okay 
whose who's responsibility is to look after those vehicles? Huh? Benz, where is it? Where is it? <coughs> yeah, it's on Highway 16. Yeah, it's the RCMP's job. Okay. What generally ends up happening? We, yeah. yeah, you see red and blues, you know, in a white car going off in the distance, thanks fire. Okay. Yeah, wait for the tow truck. Okay. You got more of them, and you know, there's more of you guys than there is of us. So you guys can wait for the tow truck. You know what? Sometimes we've had police cars that have said, you know what? No, you guys can go. We'll stay here and wait for the tow truck, right? Uh, skid works. We need yeah. cars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're going. What's that? Was it? It was a wily coyote. Yeah, the coyote. Yeah. So, again, but we can't just leave the scene, right? And we have to keep it, get it back to a, a safe situation. It's no different than a structure fire. Okay, we don't just leave a, a building abandoned, laid down on fire. Uh, if the owner is not there, we got to tape it up. We got to fence it. We got to do something. Okay. Next slide. What time is it? Twenty hours. Twenty hours. Seven. Thank you. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah, let's uh you know what? let's just go one more a couple more slides here and then we're done this chapter. Uh, successful extrication operations. So next slide. Four incident priorities. Know these. Okay, this is on page twenty-four. Okay, first and foremost, always like everything we do, personnel protection and life safety, always number one. If we're dead, we're not rescuing anybody else, okay? Incident stabilization, that's our next priority, is to stabilize the incident, okay? And that means everything from uh, cribbing to uh, getting the patient patients out, okay? Uh, and getting things all packed up and cleaned up. Property environment, environmental conservation, right? If there's fuel there that was leaking, okay, do we have to clean up fuel? No. Well, depending on the amount. Yeah. yeah, if there's a leak on the road, yeah, we, we put our floor dry. We can clean that up, okay? But if there's a whole bunch of fuel that's leaked into a ditch, okay, are we gonna shovel? No. no. So, but it's our, it's, again, whose job is it? If it's on the highway, responsibility of yours. Yeah, you call the RC, tell the RCMP, yeah, you know what? We've got a big spill here, we need to contact environment. And it's been my experience, there's not one RCMP officer that knows the emergency number to environment, nor do they know how much, what the limit is before you have to call environment. And contact environment, and they'll say, do you have someone to do it? And yeah, you know what? Again, that's knowing the resources. Who can call, who, who here knows Chris Walt's phone number that can get a truck and a Bobcat, a skid steer up to come clean up? Or Mike Gasla? Again, these are just things that, you know, over years you learn these re available resources. They're all in a book in the back of command, okay? But if command doesn't go out and somebody else is in charge, you know, who do you call, right? And an after action review. That's a, that's a priority. So because we want to learn what we did right and what we can do better. A couple more slides. One more. Okay, so roles and responsibilities. Okay, rescue personnel, right? What's rescue personnel do? Rescue, rescue. person. Yes. That they're the ones, they're the extricators, they're the ones that are getting the patient out. Law enforcement, RCMP, what's their job? Investigation. Investigation, right? Maintaining scene safety as well, okay? But they're the ones that are going to investigate. They get all the paperwork, it's sure nice if we can crawl in there and get it for them, okay? Because then that way we actually get to bill and we don't have to ask them for it. Okay, EMS, okay? Treatment, treatment and transport of patients. Fire service, right? We are fire suppression. Okay, we're there to protect uh, the the rescuers and uh, EMS and police and other response agencies. So you got your Carillions, you've got your dangerous goods teams. Okay, uh, 
We don't have our own dangerous in the city. They have their own dangerous goods team. But out here, you'd have to call a private contractor. They're all different response agencies. So, any questions on chapter one? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll come back in chapter two.